for the second day of our conference and this um, this keynote presentation. I've been looking forward to very, very much. Um, today, we will be hearing from a representative from the Pacific Island Students Fighting Climate Change. PISFCC began back in March 2019 when a group of the uh, University of the South Pacific law students from eight different Pacific Island countries decided to join together to begin a campaign to persuade the leaders of the Pacific Island Forum to take on the issue of climate change and human rights and bring it to the International Court of Justice. And if that all is, uh, we are going to be learning more about what just that means through this presentation. I would like to introduce to you all Roma Beth Siri. Roma Beth Siri started her activism in the final year of her law degree at the University of the South Pacific. She has experienced firsthand their indiscriminate destruction and crippling aftermath that has not only taken a toll, climate change's out impact, not only taken a toll on her country's economy, but the biodiversity and altered the geographical layout of coasts of some of the islands. Roma Beth hails from the Republic of Vanuatu, a Pacific Island state situated within the Ring of Fire and the Cyclone Belt. Recently, Vanuatu was ranked the most at risk to natural disasters country in the world. Roma Beth believes the projections presented in the recent IPCC report have come into existence and will continue to persist. She aims to foster resilience within rural communities through a human rights-based approach to emphasizing the right to clean, healthy, and sustainable, um, as a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. My apologies. The right to have access to clean and affordable water, and lastly, the right to clean air. Having graduated, in 2021, Roma Beth is currently obtaining her PDLD, which is a, a degree for a legal drafter. She plans on becoming a legal drafter to ensure that the interests of underrepresented and that the interests of underrepresented people in are centered in climate-centered policies and legislations as these marginalized groups are subjected to the worst impacts of climate change. Would you please all join me in welcoming Roma Beth Siri. Thank you for being here. Uh, uh, good morning, everyone from Vanuatu, and good evening to my fellow participants. Uh, once again, my name is Roma Beth Siri, and I am the Vanuatu-based campaigner for the Pacific Students Fighting Against Climate Change, or PIF, uh, PIFCC for short. Um, today's presentation will discuss the impacts of climate change within the Pacific and specifically look at the displacement and relocation policies developed as a consequence of the, uh, El, uh, Manoro, um, the Manoro, uh, uh, volcano eruption on Ambai. Uh, Ambai is just another small island um, located within Vanuatu. Uh, this will then be followed by the history of the PISFCC and its collaboration with the Vanuatu government to seek an advisory opinion at the International Court of Justice. Um, my keynote speech is relatively short as there will be a Q&A afterwards to which my colleague and campaign director Solomon Yao of the PISFCC will assist me in assist me in answering your question. So with no more further ado, I will begin. Um, in the Pacific, communities are at the front line experiencing and battling the adverse impacts of the climate change crisis, an issue that they have little to contribute to. Further at the fringes are marginalized or other vulnerable groups such as indigenous people, uh, children, youth, people with disabilities, persons of diverse sexual orientation, gender identities and expressions, Elder, um, and elderly people who, are disp uh, who disproportionately have to live with the impacts of climate crisis, often undermining the full enjoyment of their human rights and driving further economic and social inequalities, including gender inequality. 
uh, the dire consequences of climate change can no longer be ignored. And the science linking climate change to past and present emissions of greenhouse gases, uh, gases is now beyond question. Climate change is driving sea level rise, desertification, uh, disease retribution, distribution, retri uh, retribution, floods, unprecedented cape domes, uh, um, cyclone and hurricanes and other extreme weather events. Vanuatu has been hit by two, uh, five, uh, two category five cyclones, uh, the strongest in the cyclone uh, hurricane scale between the years of 2015 and 2020. During, uh, during 2017 and 2019, uh, 2018, a volcanic eruption with significant impacts occurred on the island of Ambai. The eruption affected the whole of the island and residents were uh, forcibly displaced and relocated to other islands within Vanuatu. Uh, was due to the volcanic eruption and not uh, climate change. However, lessons learned from the relocation helped to develop policies that Vanuatu has set in place if an issue of climate related um, uh, climate change related displacement or migration ever arises. Uh, these policies were entitled, uh, these po policies were called Vanuatu's Climate Change Disaster Re um, Reduction Policy and Vanuatu's National Policy on Climate Change and Disaster Displacement. These policies entail the preparation and implementation of an island relocation of affected communities to uh, safety zones, selected sites, and even permanent sites acquired uh, to uh, cater to these displaced victims. These policies also uh, guaranteed uh, relief assistance to ensure access to health, sustenance, housing, maintenance, and uh, maintenance of traditional knowledge, access to justice and education is provided to these displaced victims. In Vanuatu, the effects of climate change are already being felt in terms of impacts on fishing, ecosystem health, um, saltwater inundation of fresh water, coastal, uh, coastal areas and underground, uh, sorry, saltwater inundation of freshwater, coastal areas and underground water. But it has, and it has also comp uh, compromised food security, uh, increased uh, pest and disease outbreaks, and increased the intensity and frequency of sudden and slow on disasters. These impacts are placing existing environmental systems, government uh, governance and social structures under stress and are also increasing the drivers of internal migration within Vanuatu as people increasingly move from, uh, from, from rural areas to urban areas. Uh, in response to the catastrophic levels of climate change, uh, loss and damage faced by these small Pacific nation, Vanuatu recognized that the current level of action and support for vulnerable developing countries within multilateral mechanisms are, were, insig uh, were insig uh, insufficient. Mm. During a speech at the UN uh, United Nations General, uh, General Assembly in September of 20. 2021, Vanuatu's Prime Minister Bob Lofman called upon the international community to urgently scale up efforts to address the climate change crisis and warned that its effects are increase, uh, increasingly eluding the control of individual national governments. Uh, the government of Vanuatu had formally commenced a global initiative to request a climate uh, change advisory opinion from the International Court of Justice, dubbed the, uh, dubbed the World Court. This extraordinary initiative would not have come about without the push to seek an advisory opinion from the youth-led organization Pacific, um, uh, Pacific Students Fighting Against Climate Change, which had been campaigning for an advisory opinion since 2019. Uh, the PISFCC is a youth-led organization that, uh, that was formed by 27, uh, 27 students from the University of the South Pacific uh, in, the, uh, in March of 29, uh, 2019. Uh, these students sought to reignite Palau's legal initiative, whereby its government had attempted to seek an advisory opinion at the UNGA uh, in 2012, which unfortunately did not follow through. The organization currently serves as a vehicle to advance right-based solutions to tackle the climate crisis. The organization has two main objectives. Firstly, to take climate change and human rights to the International Court of Justice, to seek an advisory opinion, and to educate and encourage youths from the Pacific to take action against climate change. An advisory opinion uh, from the um, International Court of Justice uh, would, be an, would be instrumental in maintaining global peace like by clarifying and developing international law. Advisory opinions are by nature not adversarial. They are general legal clarifications and advice that the courts provide on specific legal questions. 
Advisory opinions have been pivotal in the establishment and development of international laws from the right to self-determination for colonized people, the prevention of genocide and nuclear disarmament. Uh, we believe it could do the same for climate change. The UN Human Rights Committee in 2018 had noted that climate change constitutes one of the most pressing and serious threats to the ability of present and future generations to enjoy, uh, to enjoy the right to life. Along with the, right to, um, along with the right to life, our Pacific communities are experiencing intensifying threats to their water and sanitation, food, health, and other of, the most basic, of their most basic human rights. These threats are not exclusive to the Pacific. As highlighted by the IPCC Climate Science Report, communities around the world are, are facing or will be facing threats similar to their, um, to, uh, similar threats to their human rights in the near future. Which begs the question, how can an advisory opinion by the International Court of Justice benefit the Pacific and probably the world in the future? Um, in the midst of such serious threats to human rights, it is important to note that states bear the ultimate responsibility to protect and provide for these rights. However, the glacial spade, uh, space pace at which um, global climate change action is progressing shows that states are failing to meet the duties and obligations to protect rights of current and future generations. This is partly because many of these duties and obligations have remained vague and unclarified under international law. An advisory opinion can help bring clarity to many of these state obligations on dealing with climate change by integrating human rights considerations. Uh, for instance, many Pacific states and communities are first, uh, are first to face the dilemma of having to relocate. Uh, to relocate. This is a result of sea level rise and exacerbated climate impacts in their countries. Internal migration of low laying and coastal communities are currently ongoing across many Pacific countries with limited support and resource capabilities to properly, properly facilitate this. Frameworks of external migration, although, although a last resort for many Pacific um, countries, also remain underdeveloped with several gaps in international law and policies that make climate migration possibilities more difficult. These gaps um, raise difficult questions such as where vulnerable, uh, climate vulnerable individuals and communities would relocate to. How will the cost of climate migration, uh, migration be borne and by whom? And what would be the status of these countries that have lost territory under international law? These are difficult questions to grapple with. Other than bilateral agreements, there are no existing international treaties that address climate migration issues. While an ad advisory opinion from the ICJ may not answer all these questions, an approach that integrates the consideration of human rights with environmental law uh, can help guide global action on climate migration. An advisory opinion from the ICJ can assist with this integration. Inter uh, integration, yes. Um, additionally, state negotiations under the UNFCCC remain the leading avenue for dealing with the climate crisis. There will be uh, this, this will be further strengthened and complemented by an advisory opinion. Uh, the voluntary state of the, uh, of the Paris Agreement requires uh, continued encouragement for ambitious climate action to meet the 1.5 um, uh, degree Celsius target. An advisory opinion can help catalyze through an effective diplomatic campaign leading up to the opinion with the opinion itself clarifying state obligations under the agreement. In doing so, the advisory opinion could help set more concrete and authoritative baselines for states to reduce their emissions and meet the human rights and climate action obligation. Uh, in, sum in summary, an ICJO is not an attempt to undermine but rather complement and bolster global climate negotiation. Uh, more specifically, but not limited to, an advisory opinion can reaffirm under the Paris, the Paris Agreement the existing state obligation on mitigation, adaptation, finance, technology transfer, and capacity building, as well as other assistance from developed countries to developing, uh, from developed countries to developing countries, drive ambitious uh, action by developed countries to um, to immediate and large scale emission reduction, clarify and integrate human rights and climate change law paving the way for progressive development of international law on difficult issues like climate migration. Enhance the effectiveness of the international legal system in tackling climate change, for example, by bolstering the authority of human rights bodies mandates to address climate change. It could also allow for the creation of new and stronger mandates, for instance, through a UN special rapporteur 
on uh, climate change and, hum and human rights. So how do we get an advisory opinion? Uh, in 2019, Pacific, uh, Pacific Island Forum leaders in their leaders communicate noted that the proposal by, the Vanuat by Vanuatu to seek an ICJO through the UN General Assembly or UNGA since then has received strong growing support. Uh, academics, legal experts, and 139 Pacific uh, civil society organizations have also supported um, Vanuatu's uh, resolution. At the UNGA, a majority vote of at least, uh, at least 97 states in support of the resolution to seek an ICJO, um, an, ICJ, uh, an, an advisory opinion on the climate change and human rights would be needed to refer to the mat, uh, for the mat, the court's court, um, consideration. Uh, before I end my speech, I would implore uh, participants to sign a petition to send to, the, to their president or to the American president uh, of, uh, to vote yes on Vanuatu's initiative uh, this, up, this coming September to ensure we meet the majority vote benchmark. We also urge participants to show up at the UN headquarters in September as a direct calling on the USG, state departments, and even Congress uh, congressional um, represent, uh, representatives to uh, vote yes. So if you are interested, please do reach out to begin this collaboration. Our website and additional resources will be circulated after the conclusion of this webinar. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Roma Beth, for teaching us so much about the advisory opinion and the campaign that BISFCC is working on right now. And I want to open the floor now to uh, for questions. Um, so this conference is amongst people of a relatively small faith community within the United States that is deeply committed to taking action to for climate justice. And um, we're gathered here over the course of this conference to think deeply about migration and the climate crisis and displacement. And um, and then also to think about how we can take action. So your, um, your, uh, your call to action is something that we will we'll make sure that we are able to facilitate and hopefully also think of the participants here as representatives from their congregations and that they can go back and, and spread and help bolster the campaign in that way. Um, and I wanted to mention that um, that the Pacific Island Students Fighting Climate Change has been in a longer term relationship than this uh, keynote with our Unitarian Universalist uh, Service Committee. And that is sort of how uh, we came to know your organization and about the amazing work that you all did. Um, but so I'm gonna open the floor. If you have a question that you would like, um, our representatives to, you could type it in the chat or you can raise your hand and I can facilitate that. Um, and I guess I, I'm gonna take the privilege of asking a, a first question, which was, um, can you tell us a little bit more about the history of Pacific Island students fighting climate change and how it came to be and how it's sort of grown since 2019? Um, yeah. Uh, I think I'm going to have to pass this question to Solomon. Um, I just started uh, working this year. I, this is my probably my first two months, so I'm relatively new to the organization. So I think Solomon Yao would um, give a much more detailed account of the history and uh, the beginning or origins of the, um, the organization. So yeah, I'll pass it over to you, Solomon. Um, hello everyone, I'm Solomon, as uh, hi highlighted, I am the campaign director of the Pacific Island Student Fighting Climate Change, just here to support our, uh, our newest member to the addition to the campaigning team, Roma Beth. Um, just quickly on the question, I think um, as highlighted, this, the, the initiative really started at the university. So University of South Pacific, young people, we really thought that, look, 
um, our governments, our people in the regions are doing as much as we can in addressing the climate crisis. But it seems like it's just all band-aids, band-aid solutions that we're trying to achieve in in us in our in our own region. And because the source, the fire that started this fire, uh, the smoke that started this fire did not come from our islands. So looking ahead, how can we really target the source, and how can we include encourage more global action in addition to the UNFCCC uh, processes, which is seemingly the only only way of progress now. People, uh, governments, and countries around. Uh, citizens around the world use it to mean to me- measure progress. So, in our background as law students, we did a we did a research on uh, mechanisms can also encourage and catalyze more ambitious action. In addition to that, so we came across the initiative of uh, the research as uh, uh, Roma has highlighted on the advisory opinion campaign, and this is the reason why we think that it is a time that. Um, Governments around the world can also consider this in an attempt to um, um, add more um, add more firepower to our, our efforts to uh, address climate change. We often use it's an, it's an idea that um, it's not a silver bullet, like it wouldn't it wouldn't address completely the advisory opinion, uh, uh, the whole climate crisis, but it's still an additional solution that we hope that uh, can contribute to addressing the situation. So that's really how the organization uh, in, uh, motivation and foundation begin. Uh, from then, we took off. We wrote to our leaders. We we put on our campaigning hats. Went out to communities, civil society, speaking, mainstreaming, socializing the campaign, getting people to understand what that advisory opinion campaign is, how it's important for the Pacific as well as the world, as Roma has highlighted. And beyond that, we went internationally to really out of a really comfort zone on, in our islands to international uh, forums and um, meetings and conferences to really streamline that this is something that could potentially add more weight beyond our efforts to address climate change. So this is how our progress is going. At the moment, civil society around the world are coming together on this, now realizing how important this campaign is, banding together, wanting to support this, as we have a tight and very practical timeline ahead, which is the United Nations General Assembly uh, that will be convening this year in September to decide where the government of Vanuatu will table the resolution to the uh, UNGA and hopefully get that simple majority vote to, to initiate the process on requesting an advisory opinion to the ICJ. Thank you for relating that story to us of the beginnings. And I, can I call upon Bill to uh, offer a question next for Roma, Beth, and Solomon? Thank you. Um, I wanna make a note first that the Paris Agreement and before the Kyoto Protocol had very little in the way of enforcement mechanisms, practically none at all. But Roma Beth mentioned one agreement which has some enforcement mechanisms, and that's the Law of the Sea Agreement. Unfortunately, the US is not a party to Law of the Sea. And that makes it very difficult for us in the US to address this as an enforceable kind of issue, I would be very pleased to see legal action taken under law of the sea, but how could it apply to the US? Um, Is that it? Question. <laughs> uh, so, yes. so could it apply to the US? I don't know if it would. Yes, I I, I completely concur with you as well. Um, when we look, when we begin uh, discussing solutions that we can take forward into international mechanism, the the international tribunal of the law of the sea was something that we did discuss as part of the efforts. One of the uh, options that we could take to seek uh, in uh, asking for redress to it. Um, one 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 issue in that uh, two. Um, one issue in that we see that um, it would be um, it, it's something related to countries that are all have interest vested interest in oceans. But as we do know, there are, still, there are landlocked states out there in the world as well that are not able to uh, not really have strong interest in the law of the sea. And other thing is that the General Assembly it does have that uh, all encompassing in inclusion of all states around the world to participate in this. So that's just one thing that we saw, although it's still very important. Um, I would like to also highlight that this, there's an effort that is ongoing. It's spearheaded by one of the Pacific Island country governments as well, Tuvalu. 
And then also in, in collaboration with Antigua and Barbuda, they're pushing for an advisory opinion as well, or other international, uh, sorry, legal mechanisms or options or redress in the ITLOS, ITLOS at the moment as we speak. And that has been announced just recently at COP26 in last October to November, early November last year. Um, before we call on Bruce, I had a question for Roma Beth, which you spoke to after the volcano, how solutions around um, came to Vanuatu about how to handle after that natural disaster. And earlier today, we spoke about um, the importance of preserving culture when, uh, when we sometimes are forced to move uh, migrate um, both within our countries and, and to other countries. And I was curious to learn about if efforts within Vanuatu for uh, preserving culture and, and what, what had been done around um, that issue within the country where you are. And if that's a bad question and you want to redirect to something that makes a little bit more sense, that's fine too. Roma, would you uh, unmute? That's uh, sorry. Uh, that's a really good question. Um, in regards to the preservation of our culture, just recently, our Ministry of Education has created a curriculum that is dedicated to just learning about our different cultures. And in Vanuatu, um, different um, pr um, provinces or have different. Um, different customs, not even provinces, different islands have different um, um, customs that are associated to a specific island. So having our um, Minister of Education develop a, um, a curriculum that uh, that is sort of like individualized to a person's specific uh, cultural identity uh, just reinforces that our future generation will always have like a, um, like a, a, like a, maybe a, uh, a book, not a book, a um, something to look or just a guide for how to um, learn about their culture. And in re, um, but in a, just in relation to that, we also have a um, we have provincial days. So every year we have a specific day dedicated to a specific um, province, and then from there you can learn about their different cultural um, uh, uh, clothing, food. So it's very inclusive. So it's not just uh, it does it doesn't just uh, it's not just for one um, person from one specific island. You it's very inclusive. So other islands and other um, provinces get to learn about your um, island. I mean about your customs. So it's very inclusive and it's very and it's. I think in one or two we take pride in sort of like showing off our culture. We want people to be aware of what we have from our island, and having our uh, minister of education incorporate that in our um, educational system just. Um, enforces that. So yeah, so culture is a very big thing to us. Thank you so much. Bruce, would you want to offer a, a question for Roma Beth and Solomon? Yes, I just want to uh, introduce myself. First of all, my name is Bruce Knotts and I represent the Unitarian Universalist Association at the United Nations. So I'm very interested in this uh, GA vote in September uh, you mentioned a few other island states that are near Vanuatu that are supporting this initiative. Do you have any other countries that are supporting it? And is there anything that perhaps we could do to raise awareness of this uh, vote and, and perhaps get uh, people, get countries to, to vote on this? Is there anything we can do to help uh, make this uh, vote happen? And I agree with you. I, the ICJ uh, decision, if there is a decision that's favorable, it, it's not the end of the story. It, it will certainly help your cause. It will give you a boost, but it doesn't completely um, solve the problems. And the, the basic problem, as I see it, is that we've got to keep uh, the global warming to less than 1.5 degrees Celsius. 
Otherwise, there will be sea level rises, and that's that's going to be very hard on um, island states that that uh, suffer from that. And the part of what we're talking about with culture is one of the solutions that is often offered. If if you cannot live where you are, you move to another place. But if you move to another place, then what happens to your culture, and how do you keep your culture alive? So the optimal uh, solution is to keep you where you are so that you can maintain your lives and your culture in your traditional ways. But again, I'd, I'd be interested in anything we can do to help. And if any other countries, uh, maybe larger countries, New Zealand, Australia, are, are in any way supportive of this initiative. Thank you, Bruce, for your contributions. And I concur with your, your points there. I would like to highlight that um, I, I completely agree that uh, uh, re what is relocation, planned relocation, or forced displacement, all of this happens. And um, people, all of this happens as a last resort. Um, people do not want to leave their homes in the Pacific, and we will consider that definitely as a last resort. Um, but of course, there are still very breaking points as, as the climate crisis intensifies. The community social nets and all this is still uh, hinging on thin ice at the moment. And the more we close, inch closer to the 1.5 degree, the more it becomes worse. Um, I agree, it's not a silver bullet, that Vice Opinion campaign, but in, in a way, it's, um, um, you, I always picture this waterfall flowing down as a climate change and someone holding a, a cup, trying to catch some water to prevent the flow. And then uh, I'm sure one person alone couldn't do anything about this. Uh, and I see that as the Paris Agreement, uh, that holding that cup, trying to catch all of the problems. Now the ICJ can also bring its own cup and hopefully not a cup, but a like KFC bucket, the large size, like this big, so that they can also catch more water as well to contribute. And I hope that someone seeing someone carrying a KFC bucket under the waterfall might also bring a, a tank perhaps and coming in and joining in to catch more water. And you see the bigger picture of how collective action, inspiration, inspiring collective action around the world can truly is the only way that we can address this climate, um, climate crisis. Now, it's very interesting that the court can also provide a lot of guidance in particular when uh, a state might raise that is 1.5 a state obligation under international law in, uh, in the ICJ? They can also highlight that. And in, in answering that, if it's an international obligation, that will send shockwave across the world in courts, uh, and tribunals that be able to give more guidance for their own citizens if they were to take their government and encourage their government in courts, perhaps a little bit of nudge and saying that, look, international court of justice said 1.5 degree is an obligation and your current efforts are not meeting to that standards. Please please continue to follow your obligations. So you see it's, it has that um, uh, an ability to do that. Now, coming to your uh, the, the question, it's, I would like to share with you all guys, I've never been so excited in this in this point of campaign. And I'm sure all of all of us here in the Pacific are very excited because in, in uh, we're hoping that in, in some part of the year, uh, very soon as we anticipate, the, uh, the Pacific Island Forum will be convening. So Pacific Island Forum is the international in, intergovernmental uh, regional framework uh, organization. The government will be tabling the advisory opinion in that in that meeting and hoping to we can get the endorsement. Roma did mention that we did did this in 2019. It was only noted in positive terms, but never endorsed. Now it's to complete the unfinished business. Um, hopefully, we'll get the endorsement this year, and the government will take lead, and the coalition will come out from the region, looking for support from governments all across the world. Now, because this campaign is very serious for us, civil society and young people in the Pacific, we are also coming to New York and we'll be based there for six months. So if you are in America and you want to support you, come and speak to us. We will think of, we might not have a, any actions to think about it, but of course, when we, we meet together, I'm sure a lot of crazy ideas and mischiefs and actions we can all take together because we don't really understand how the American work, America works and how American political system works. Help us understand that and help us influence your government to support this on the ground. Thank you. I'm certainly looking forward to Miss Jeff. Thank you. And that's really exciting. When, when, when does your six months of uh, being here in New York um, begin? 
Thank you, Steve. Uh, we'll be, we will be having a team arriving on the end of June. I wanna ask our participants or planning committee members, are there other questions that are arising for you given our presentation, learning about the advisory opinion, this campaign. Gary, would you offer a question for Roma, Beth, and Solomon? Yes, uh, just bear me looking it up. What was the sec, I have a couple questions. Uh, what was the second goal that Roma, Beth uh, uh, talked about regarding the uh, objectives of PSFACC? And second, the, secondarily, uh, what do they think of the film, the documentary, Anote's Ark? Uh, those are my two questions. Thanks, Gary. So what's the second plank of the objectives? And um, if, they had, if they were familiar with this documentary, Anote's arc if, if it was something that felt representative of yeah, what's going on for them. Okay. Um, would it so, be helpful to share that? Um, for the second objective, um, the purposes of PISFCC is to also encourage um, the youth to have a more participatory um, uh, involvement in cl the climate change uh, crisis. Um, so it's just to get, uh, you know, get stu uh, young people more involved to voice out their concerns as to what they think the climate uh, crisis might eventually, um, uh, what it, how it might affect their future. So it's just to get them more aware and about how climate change is um, affecting them and will affect them in the future and perhaps their children and their children's children. So, yeah. And as to the documentary, unfortunately, I have not watched it and, I am very intrigued now. So if you're willing to write it down in the chat, I will make sure to take a look at it. Well, me and Solomon will, of course. Solomon seemed to indicate that maybe he knew about it, um, but I did put it in the chat. And Thanks, it's Gary. very compelling. Uh, it was on the uh, CBC uh, this week. Uh, which is the Canadian Broadcasting Channel. So nationally, it was uh, shared in their Earth Day uh, week-long series of presentations. Thanks, Gary. Uh, Gabor, do you have a question? Uh, yeah, yeah, I do. So thank you for joining us uh, all the way from uh, Vanuatu. Um, I don't really know anything about Vanuatu, so just a couple of simple questions, I guess. I, I assume it's an island nation composed of many islands. And I'm just curious, uh, are they, how many of them are inhabited? How are there, are they all uniformly low lying? Are there some islands which are potentially not inhabited that could be, you know, maybe not quite so endangered, that kind of thing? Uh, okay. Um, Vanuatu is mostly comprised of low lying islands and there is 84 uh, inhabitable islands. Um, other than that, um, the, the islands that are uh, within the, the geographical uh, layout are not hospitable, like you, humans cannot survive on them. Um, uh, I think that's about it. Um, where well, a- um, are, are the inhabitable islands already inhabited? Uh, all of them or- Yes. Are some? Yes, okay. <laughs> Great, thanks. That's the term. Um, We're very small, so we, we try to make use of all the space. <laughs> Ned, would you like to offer a question? For our sure. Uh, we are, uh, first of all, thank you very, very much for being with us tonight. Um, we are uh, an intergenerational seminar, and uh, I'm wondering what, uh, whether you think uh, you, the organization has a, a, of the young people has had a positive and um, perhaps uh, um, incentive for older leaders uh, in Vanuatu and in, in your in region 
to be more active because youth are uh, lighting a fire under their posteriors. Um, in regards to Vanuatu, we've always been um, huge climate change activists. Um, we, um, I think we, were, um, we had our most famous um, female politician, um, Hilda Lini. She was, uh, is, she had essentially, um, uh, she, she's helped with the um, nuclear uh, disarmaments back in, uh, the, I think it was the 80s. So she, Vanuatu has always been at the forefront of climate activism. It's sort of what we're always, um, it's sort of like our niche, um, considering we're the most at risk uh, country in the world to climate uh, natural disasters um, and uh, are we, like, like we're the most at risk, we're always at the forefront of for advocating. So our politicians, it's just naturally ingrained uh, to them to always advocate for climate change. Um, most, uh, we've, we have uh, Ralph Reagan Vanu, he's the most, one of the most notable um, politicians in Vanuatu and he's always been at the forefront for act, uh, advocating for climate change. So I'd say our older politicians, it's just been, uh, we don't we don't need to like force them they just have it ingrained in them to um, be active in the uh, environmental uh, sector so yeah we have very active politicians all right i i was i'm responding to solomon wanting to also hear from youth uh, what uh youth understood to, to also including our young adult emerging adults. Uh, um, and Lyndon, did you have a question or did you want to um, respond back to our presenters or something like that? We'd love to hear from you. Yeah, I just had a question um, about what exactly the um, the advisory opinion is and would entail and how how that would really, you know, change the momentum on climate action and would really like compel um, countries to take action. Like I'm just uh, interested in some clarification on that. I can take this one, Roma, if that's all right. Yes. <laughs> right. Um, I understand it's a very, a very technical campaign. So I will just do this. We have created an anim animation that really simplifies all of the process. So it's just two minutes. I put the link there. You can watch that and have a think about that. If you have more questions, of course, reach out to us. We're happy to clarify for you. Okay, thank you. Brenda? Hi. Um... Yes, I had a question. Um, Roma Beth, you mentioned um, the movement of from rural areas to urban areas, and I was wondering if you could expand on that more. Okay, so in Vanuatu, we have two urban centers. Um, we have Port Vila, which is the capital of Vanuatu, and we have uh, Luganville, which is another it's almost another developed play, uh, state um, island of Vanuatu, but it's not as developed as Port Vila. So from those areas, you have islands around them or you, even within, well, let me explain this better. So you have areas in town and you have areas outside, outside of town. So outside of town would be rural areas. They don't have that much um, uh, infrastructure development. They're very, um, uh, very underdeveloped in the sense of, um, uh, like, you know, uh, structure, cities and things. So they don't have that many shops, not many schools. And most of the inhabitants there are subsistent farmers. So they don't have access to like, you know, modern day technology. They don't have access to electricity. They're very reliant on generators that are, generate, uh, that are fueled uh, by petrol. So it's very, very um, like a very country-like situation. Like, uh, but whereas in the urban areas, these are like your towns, your cities, you have shops everywhere, access to um, amenities, electricity. So it's much more um, comfortable. Whereas in a rural area, you grow your own crops, you're dependent on your, your generators for electricity and you're, it's, you're very self-sufficient. So yeah, so those are rural areas. 
if that makes uh, sense. Anna, did you have a question? Yeah, I did. Thank you so much for being here. I've enjoyed this so much so far. I was just wondering, I'm still in high school and since Vanuatu is such like, has such a strong like um, climate change like movement, I was wondering if you had any advice for other high school students on how they could like different strategies to continue the climate change movement and like, I don't know, I guess any tactics that has really worked in Vanuatu that we might be able to also implement um, in our own like high schools, our own communities. Um, so in Vanuatu, uh, like I had previously stated, we are at the, we are facing like climate change is our everyday reality. So it's always ingrained in our curriculum. So we'll have quizzes, we'll have marches, we'll have poetry competitions, just uh, detailing our experiences with climate change. And we've had debates on how do we include climate change in our curriculums? Should it be within a subject or should it be a, a specific um, or should it be like sort of like divided into different topics with this that's just sort of like uh, placed into different um, subject areas or should it be a subject of its own? Um, in terms of what else, um, we have marches, we have, um, we broadcast it on like Facebook, YouTube, and then we have um, maybe stories or um, video competitions, just, uh, or short video competitions where we talk about our struggles with climate change. Um, we have plays, student plays that we always do. So it's just trying to get as much awareness as possible, but for yourself as We seemed at that moment to have a connectivity issue. Is that yes. right? Okay. Let me just pause for a moment. Hmm. Solomon notes in the chat, we're experiencing the famous island internet. So your, everyone's patience is quite appreciated. It seems that Roma Beth might be trying to reconnect or something like that. And may I pose another question, which is, um, it may be that my perspective is very slanted on this, but I was curious about being a student and also working on a campaign at the same time. And just, I, I know that I like work with a lot of youth and young adults who are always having to navigate that balance a lot. And Solomon, I was sort of curious from your experience of having been a, a, a full-time student, I'm assuming, and then also seemingly a full-time campaigner, uh, just how you've navigated that. I think um, young people hearing about how to navigate that is, is pretty important to us because we do also want to help make change and often find ourselves in institutions and, and schools. Thank you, Steve. Um, um, <laughs> I am currently no longer a student. I am working as the campaign director supporting the organization, but it wasn't, it wasn't that long before I was a student. It was actually 2019 when I was starting off um, as a member of the organization. Um, I, was, I was also helping out with a lot of stuff related to the organization in terms of administration, writing, drafting, and all that. And at some point, we have to, we have to fly all the way to New York um, to meet with, uh, to attend some conference and to meet with partners. This is all new, all new for us young students. I was, I remember I was flying, flying on an airplane, typing my two major assignments, which are due like the time I will be, I will be landing in the, in the airport in New York. So it was quite a traumatic experience for me. And then after landing, submitted assignments and went out to do a climate strike right after that. So 
I think you could say that this is this is this guy is crazy or anything, but I think back then when we are learning about the human rights uh, connection to climate change, and then we realize the full full extent of how what this means to us for Pacific Island countries, uh, and in especially going towards in the near future, you have that and you have you know, you have all that convictions just flood back into you like wow. I have the ability to do something and all this pressure is encouraging me to, to push myself into representing the best I can for my for my people in my country and my region. So I think that conviction, it really comes to mind. And I, nowadays, I, I believe that every young people out there, if they read, a, read just a little bit, they would understand how important the climate crisis is, in, in especially to their future and young people. So everyone now from the Pacific, but now as the um, latest IPCC report highlights, all regions across the world are now impacted uh, impacted by climate change. And therefore, why are young people elsewhere in the world shouldn't have the same conviction as specific island people in, in, the, in our region. So having that conviction is, is the understanding that, yes, we do have, we do want to go and socialize with our friends and do to watch, um, uh, watch Netflix and doom scroll on Facebook or social media. But we have to realize that if we continue to neglect the problem or do not, to not see this problem, uh, to not take action against it. It's really our future and the future of our children will be affected. That conviction is the stepping, the first stepping stone. Thank you so much for that answer. Roba Beth, I know you probably were having uh, connectivity issues and you were in the midst of describing sort of like how the education about climate change is just so integrated into everything you learn at school and things like that. So if there's anything else you wanted to add to that answer, if you'd like to go back to it, we'd welcome that. And also I had just posed a question to Solomon, which was like, we have a lot of young people here who are in high school or maybe you find themselves in college and also are probably navigating uh, working uh, on uh, campaigns and activism and also going to school and sort of, I was curious to hear how you've navigated that balance and, uh, or yeah, uh, between those two things, being a student and working in activism like you do, so. Um, so I started my activism the last semester of my law degree. Um, and I made sure to take courses that were in line with environmentalism so that it would just be sort of like it would work well with my coursework. So just to broaden my understanding. So I just I, I was very strategic about it. I made sure that my my work was in line with my activism. So um, but as for time management, I would say it was it was hard, uh, especially with Zoom calls that being at, at odd hours, I made sure to just, just know, just time manage, delegate, but don't like try to overstress yourself. Don't do many, uh, everything at once because you will get burned out. So I tried to limit myself, but at the same time, um, make sure that my studies were of, the, of like my top priorities and my activism came second because I needed my education in order to continue my uh, activism if I wanted to pursue this as a career goal. So. I made sure to take all the right courses that were in line with my um, and activism. And I, uh, regardless of how much I wanted to, you know, always be on the forefront, I made sure to put my studies first because I knew end of the day, I needed my degree. So, yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Um, before we go to you, Bruce, I just wanted, if they, Imelo, if you wanted to have a question or anything like that, um, the floor is yours, but you can also say no. <laughs> um, sure. I mean, I don't really have a question, but um, aloha mai kako. Um, as like another Pacific Islander um, from Hawaii, um, you know, I feel like a lot of people who aren't from the Pacific have kind of like a really big misunderstanding of just kind of like how, I mean, like, you know, thousands of miles apart, you and me, like from Vanuatu, but, you know, there's still a lot of similarities in the sense of like our islands are our homes. You know, we've been living here for thousands and thousands of years, you know, like our ancestors are buried here, our children are raised here, our families are from here. Um, and so a lot of people who are not from the Pacific, um, I feel like a lot of people are just, they just kind of push this idea of like, oh, why can't you just move? Why can't you just, you know, go someplace else? But it's like, it's not that, it's not that like, it's not that easy. You cannot just leave your home and your your ancestors and your people and like everything that's um, from there. And like so much of our lives are like tied to the land. 
Um, mm -hmm. It's not just, it's not just, you know, you cannot just pick up and move. And even it's just to a different Pacific Island that's still, or just like a different Island within your, your community, you know, like, like Oahu where I'm from is completely different from the other islands in the chain. So, you know, people who are from the outer islands move to Oahu is a completely different experience. And like, even like within this, these eight major islands, it's such a big disconnect just to be a couple hundred miles away from home. So I feel like that's like a big misunderstanding a lot of people have. And also just like how the Pacific is one of the most vulnerable communities um, in the world. And people just kind of forget that we exist. I mean, I've like so many times people just like not knowing like where Hawaii is people are like oh isn't it next to Mexico because of the where it is on the maps of the, the when they have like the map of America and Hawaii's next to Mexico in a little box and they're like oh it's down there right I'm like no <laughs> it is in the middle um yeah and just like the the kind of like um interlocking kind of issues that we face like yes it's sea level rise and ocean acidification and land loss but it's also like um, you know, like our water supplies running out, you know, um, for us in Hawaii on my island, our largest aquifer just got poisoned by the US military. Um, they leaked a bunch of fuel in it. And it's like, we're an island in the Pacific, where are we going to get more fresh water? And it's, you know, it's all these interlocking things. And especially the US military in general, at least um, in the islands that the US like has um, bases on is like the biggest kind of um, environmental uh difficulty to deal with um yeah so i think it's i'm really happy that you guys were invited here to talk today because um so often you know especially with it being like earth day and earth week uh, everyone's always talking about how important it is we have to like um think about climate change but it's always for a lot of people still in the future but for us mm -hmm. in the pacific it's the now and it's also been in like in the past it's been the past couple years um so yeah i think it's really important that we recenter ourselves in the Pacific. So yeah, thank you for coming. <laughs> thank you. I almost want to end here. Bruce, <laughs> if you got a tight question to offer our end, but that thanks for that word in Maloa and thank you for to our presenters. My my comment is actually related, and I googled Vanuatu culture, and mm -hmm. Google says there are 110 million results to that to that post. So the first one says Vanuatu is recognized as one of the most culturally diverse countries in the world. Dances, ceremonies, status, and systems of authority artistic styles, animal and crop husbandry can vary from island to island and often from district to district. I'm wondering if you could tell us something about the very rich culture of Vanuatu and why we need to preserve that. Oh, I don't know where to start. Like you had said, um, culture is different from district to di district, village to village. So uh we have such a diverse um array of different cultures and with those cultures come different beliefs different um traditional knowledge about certain like, let's say by uh, plants certain ways of coping with natural disasters that maybe one specific island didn't have that the other had so every island has a way of coping with natural disasters prob um, med um, they have medicinal um, herbs that maybe the other island isn't aware of and also just our traditional way of doing things or the way we, we make food, that it just, it's different from places to places. And the way you make food can also um, be a way of preserving food during times of natural disasters. So we all have like different ways of doing things, but they all serve a common purpose, but the way we do it is different. And if we lose that knowledge or that traditional knowledge, um, then, how do we adapt to climate change and things like that? So you need to keep those um, different varying perspectives or different types of cultures alive so that they, you can have a different ways or uh, like different um, systems of how to survive uh, uh, climate change. But um, regardless of that, you have like different types of customs, you have different types of traditional wear that the way you make your, uh, your clothes, you probably wouldn't do the same in another island. So.
yes like i was saying the way you do things varies from island to island sorry i'll, I'll just finish that off so uh the way you do things uh, varies from different island to island and they all have different types of traditional knowledge that you have to keep and different they're different dialects and they're slowly losing out they were slowly losing them over time because Vanuatu is so um uh, dependent on our um, national languages which is Bishlama French and English so we're all we're just trying to learn those different uh, language like those national languages that we're slowly losing our local dialect and it's sad because you know, when we go back to the villages, how do we communicate with people? We're just so reliant on our national languages. We don't know how to like converse in our local dialect. So it's essential that we maintain our traditional uh, values, because um, traditional knowledge, because one day, if perhaps let's say an island disappears or we are forced to re relocate to another island, like in the case of Ambai, um, people from Ambai had to uh, relo relocate to this island called Santo. They had to give up certain um, traditional knowledge to sort of like, um, uh, sort of blend in with the locals. Cause sometimes our way of doing things, uh, our cultural way of doing things tends to clash. And if we don't blend or learn to do things the way of another island does or carries themselves, you could cause a bit of tension. So yeah, um, um, climate change and the loss of an island or having to reloc uh, relocate is just a, a huge loss to not just our like uh, land, but also our a sense of identity, our knowledge, our just who we are as a person. We have this term in Vanuatu called uh, belongingness. Um, so if you're from a different island, you always have you'll never have like a sense of belongingness unless you're back in your own island. So even if you're in another place, your identity, who you are, is um, intrinsically linked to what, the island that you're from. So yeah, so uh, who we are, our customs, our cultures are all just linked to who the island, the specific island that we're from, or the specific region or village even. So yeah, that's about it. Thank you so much, Roma Beth, for sharing. And I want to conclude by um, imploring all of us here who have been participants to this keynote to um, that you, as Unitarian Universalists, um, have come into contact with this uh, group, Pacific Island Students Fighting Climate Change, through a relationship with the Unitarian Universalist Service Committee. And that's something that extends past the moment of this keynote, but we can also bolster that relationship by responding to the specific asks that we've heard from Roma Beth and Solomon today around the campaign and the upcoming um, sort of point of this campaign that's coming up with the General Assembly coming up in September. Um, you can trust from your um, planning committee. I'll work with Rob to make sure that you have the toolkit that Solomon um, referenced. And um, I believe Salote from UUSC is putting together that United States-based petition uh, connected with the campaign that our folks are working on. We'll be sure to also have the links to the, the, um, the video explaining advisory opinions coming up and things like that you're not going to get it tonight so i just asked for your patience on that um but uh but uh it will come and and that's what a long-term relationship can look like and i've really appreciated uh solomon and roma beth you both being here and being so generous with your time um i bet these were not exactly the questions you expected to get asked but uh we really appreciate sharing uh, all that you did both in like uh, how you approach your work and like the specifics of the campaign. I feel like I've learned so much about how a campaign can grow and uh, we can work towards this and the strategies that you're employing, um, but also about you as individuals and the cultures where you come from and, um, and how you approach the work together. So um, it's really a privilege for us to have had you as guests here. And um, if you want to say anything else at this moment, you are welcome to. Otherwise, we can close um, and uh, you can continue with your morning. Uh, 
uh, I just wanted to say thank you for having us on this platform and for letting us um, just explain who we are and explain our initiative. So yes, just thank you so much for being here and listening to us. Thank you. And I, I trust that you see the thanks coming in in the chat and people raising their hands and thanks as well. So uh, we really uh, appreciate you all and uh, thanks for being here. All right.